that because of the advocacy of Dying with Dignity Canada, mm -hmm. uh, it helped to get the laws changed. It um, helped to make made uh, legal in Canada. Mm -hmm. So um, I and it's continuing. Uh, it's advocacy work. So not only is is it continuing to educate people, but really advocating for things that people now are are seeing as uh, their right as as a citizen in Canada. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it. Hi, I'm Xian Xiao, and I'm Sammy Winemaker. Welcome to the Waiting Room Revolution podcast. Today on our episode, we are so excited to meet Bunny Bresver, Roz Doctorow, and Peter McCauley. They are members of the Dying with Dignity Canada Toronto chapter. And so welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sammy and I met you guys earlier this year uh, at on the National Advanced Care Planning Day, uh, Dying with Dignity Canada, the Toronto chapter had a day about advanced care planning and meeting the community. Um, and we had the, pre the pleasure of presenting with our friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Myers. He hosted it and mm -hmm. he's also been on our podcast. Um, and it was just so exciting to uh, meet your organization and learn about it because I think that we have a lot more in common than I think we mm -hmm. might have originally thought, the palliative care world and the dying with dignity world. So maybe we can start with Bunny. I can just ask you, can you tell us about the organization Dying with Dignity Canada? What's it all about? Well, Dying with Dignity Canada is a national human rights organization, and it became a registered Canadian charity in 1982. Uh, the goal is protecting end-of-life rights for Canadian citizens and to help Canadians avoid unwanted suffering. Mm -hmm. So um, it's evolved into, it's branched out into many areas, uh, but the main three areas are advocacy, as I'm sure many of you have heard with um, around medical assistance in dying and the current issues around uh, mental health issues. And one is closest to my heart is advanced requests. So there's advocacy, there's support. Anyone in the community can call Dying with Dignity and answer, ask questions about how to proceed. Uh, and there's support in uh, smaller areas across the country. There are other chapters besides ours. And one of the ones that are chapter, which is fairly new, we're in our only fifth year, um, is education and outreach. And over our short time, we have uh, created many workshops, which initially had to be online because we we were born into COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do uh, in-person presentations and workshops in a number of areas. And the other thing that I think is really important for people to know in terms of education and familiarizing themselves with Dying with Dignity Canada or GTA is there is an incredibly comprehensive website, mm. DWDC, mm -hmm. Dying with Dignity Canada, that uh, offers our history, uh, how to get involved with advocacy, um, how to um, obtain an advanced um, care plan kit and many videos that people have made that talk to specific issues about the rest of your life and specifically the end of your life. Hmm. So that's that's what Dying with Dignity is about. I, You know what? I, I'm going to check out the website in more detail uh, because as you're speaking, I was just wondering, you know, that um, medical assistance in dying in Canada became legalized in the way after this organization was born, right? You 2016. mentioned 2016. Yeah. And you mentioned that this organization has been around since the 80s. So what was the what was the thrust of the work um, in the early days? Um, Letty, I think Letty, I wasn't around then involved. <laughs> of but, course not. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think the, the key word is dignity and respect. Mm. And it was started, and I don't know much about this, by mm. a nurse. Uh, 
and social worker, I believe. I have to check into that in more detail. Uh, and it was concerned about like all of us who are involved in this, they look mm -hmm. around at their family members, at their friends, and in cases of nurses and social workers, their patients and clients, and they see the gaps mm. and they feel for these people. Mm. And there was no nowhere to go, nothing to do. And with MAID, it was against the law. And uh, so they they started that. Mm. How it's evolved, I don't know that part of the history, to be honest. I just know the more recent ones, and it's mm -hmm. become a much more dynamic mm -hmm. resource. I think it's always been an advocacy organization. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I would guess that because of the advocacy of Dying with Dignity Canada, mm -hmm. uh, it helped to get the laws changed. It um, helped to make made uh, legal in Canada. Mm. So um, I and it's continuing uh, its advocacy work. So not only is is it continuing to educate people, but really advocating for things that people now are are seeing as uh, their right as as a citizen in Canada. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it. And that brings me to there. There's a um, a booklet on patient rights that you can yes. download from the um from the website that's incredibly important when yeah. when i guide when i direct people to it they go, i didn't know that i didn't yeah. and a lot of times people say is medical assistance and dying legal i mean there there are such gaps in knowledge mm -hmm. yeah whoops mm -hmm. so, so can i ask peter and bring you into the conversation so this organization when did you get involved and what drew you to to want to volunteer your time? Um, I've been involved for two or three years and I've had a, an ongoing interest in outreach and education. And the Toronto chapter has a, a strong uh, effort in that area. So I, I was pleased to be able to join and become part of the Toronto chapter's education and outreach efforts. Mm -hmm. S so maybe I can follow up with Roz, because I think you are the lead of that uh, committee. And I actually think that's where Waiting Room Revolution and, um, you know, where we overlap, because we're trying to do public education, meet people early so they know their rights, so to speak, or their, yeah. the things that they didn't know. And so they're not saying, I didn't know that. So I'd love to hear about some of the programs that you offer and, you know, some of the ones that you think have really made a difference. So I'm uh, the co-chair of the education committee. And uh, as Bunny said, we had, you know, we, we just formed uh, when COVID started. And so since then, we've developed four uh, seminars, workshops that we've been doing online. Uh, the first two that we developed, the first two uh, were around uh, advanced care planning. And then there was one on MAID and the advanced care planning uh, seminar that we give really helps people understand how important it is to get all the paperwork done to think about you know what they want mm -hmm. if, if they aren't able to speak for themselves who would that person be who would speak for them um, and and again it's a, about rights your right as a patient what you need to be able to to do and say to make sure that when you get into a situation um, that those rights that you've identified for yourself, what you want for yourself, are are um, followed. So yeah. um, if you can't speak for yourself, somebody has to be able to speak for you. And so mm -hmm. we really, really spend a lot of time talking to people about that. In fact, today, I, I just heard on the news, this was shocking to me, that a sick man who was um, unconscious, he fell down the stairs, he was an older man, and part of his religion was that they never shave. He was not allowed to shave as part mm -hmm. of his religion. He wasn't able to speak for himself. The hospital contacted his family who said, no, do not shave him. Mm -hmm. And they shaved him anyway. Okay. So th it's so important for us mm -hmm. to make sure that we respect the wishes of patients. So mm -hmm. that's that's really our advanced care planning is, is really focused on that. And then our second session, uh, I think that we developed was 
medical assistance in dying. And as Bunny said, again, we uh, meet so many people who say, what do you mean? It's legal? You can do this in Canada? Mm -hmm. They don't know. So mm -hmm. we talk to them about what it's all about. What is MAID? How did MAID uh, develop? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the rules and regulations around it? Uh, how you access medical assistance in dying? Um, mm -hmm. And then what are the issues related to MAID? What is the current legislation? And what are we trying to do to see if we can make the changes that the majority of people in Canada are, are asking for? Mm -hmm. And so right now in Quebec, uh, in fact, mm -hmm. they have, um, they're, they're going ahead with um, advanced requests. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so they are a province in advance of everywhere else. And they're trying to get that instituted in that province so that if you... If I, at this age, in my right mind, were mm -hmm. to say, if the time comes when I can't speak for myself because I'm not in my right mind, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to request medical assistance in dying when I come to a point where, for example, I don't know anybody, can't care for myself, I, you know, I, I need toileting and uh, feeding and all of those things, then I would like to request that at that time I uh, be allowed to access MAID. So... This is a very important part of the legislation that we're advocating for right now. Um, we're also doing a, a workshop or a seminar uh, on end of life. Um, what, what you as a, a person, when you reach that point in your life, what are your options? Uh, mm -hmm. So we include talk about palliative care. We include talk about you know what it is you can access and how to access it, including made as well. So all, the, all of those three are the main mm -hmm. programs that we've been providing. And we've just started to do some of this, do them uh, in person. And then mm -hmm. the very last one is Seven Keys. And mm -hmm. Bunny and Peter are the ones who've been on the road to do the Seven Keys <laughs> um, presentations. And it really does dovetail with everything else we've been doing. It talks about advanced care planning it talks about end of life it talks about made but also it talks about what ha what do you need to do as a patient mm -hmm. as a caregiver as a friend as a family member to be able to access the medical system when you need to how do you talk to your doctor how do you talk to the hospital so mm -hmm. we're really excited to be now engaged in in this uh, presentation as part of our what we present to the to the public and um, it's, it's it's like Peter was the person who really, really got us going and he wouldn't let go until we followed through and started uh, started to look at that and develop it. So this that's pump, why we're here. This yeah. pump for Peter. Yeah. Peter, Peter this, yeah. you have to put your fist up, Peter. <laughs> oh, <this Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe you can share the story, Peter. How did you hear about us and how did you bring that to Dying with Dignity? Well, it's a bit of a story. I, I attended a Hospice Palliative Care Ontario conference about a year and a half ago. And mm -hmm. CN, you were presenting and I think, Sammy, you were not able to be there that day. And one of the things that you talked about, CN, was the fact that you and Sammy had this book coming out. And mm -hmm. so I pre-ordered a copy and mm -hmm. when it arrived, I read it and I thought it was a great book. And I thought it was a great book because it addressed topics I hadn't previously seen addressed, particularly in very simple language. Mm -hmm. And and I thought it was very tactical. You know, if you're dealing mm -hmm. with a life-changing diagnosis, these are very specific, simple, tactical things you can do that will make a big difference. And and in some ways, it it also kind of wrote down and um, codified a lot of the things that social workers and palliative care physicians do and made it accessible to everybody, which I thought mm -hmm. was great. So I sent copies of the book to the members of the senior management team at um, Dying with Dignity Toronto. Mm -hmm. We just got it in the mail. <laughs> oh, oh, you mailed it to everyone. Yeah, I did. it was delivered. Yeah, yeah it just cute. arrived. And, and it kind of went from there. It seemed to resonate with the group because... Roz uh, already had an existing relationship with CN mm -hmm. and um, the Dying with Dignity was looking for something for the advanced care planning day coming up in April. So that connection was easy. And Bunny has a relationship with Dr. Jeff Myers. So that part was easy. 
and the national office and Helen Long were very supportive. So it all came together to the national ACP day where um, Sian and Sammy and Dr. Jeff Myers all uh, spoke to the assembled group. Mm -hmm. And then I took it a step further and started to draft a presentation based on the book to complement the three existing presentations. And the Toronto group has worked to refine that. And we're just now starting to present to groups. So um, presented last week to one group and we're presenting mm -hmm. to another group tomorrow afternoon. Um, so that's it's kind of the way it's evolved. It's it's such a nice story. I, I love it. I remember when CN said, oh, the Dying with Dignity chapter of Toronto would like to uh, connect with us about our work. I was thinking, you mean the Dying with Dignity? <laughs> I was one of those people that had a very narrow understanding of this organization. And uh, we couldn't be more pleased because the overlap uh, between the work that you do and the work that we do is really about patient advocacy and patient rights and including their um, families as well. So we, we might come at it from different issues, but the, the foundation is that um, patients and families don't know what they don't know. And, and then they just get sort of blown around the healthcare system and end up dizzy. And doctors yeah. don't know a lot about the patients. Right. And That's they right. have to know ways of looking at the subtext, looking at other parts yeah. of the patient to see yeah. who they are what's important to them, how, mm -hmm. how they see themselves and with a diagnosis, how they want to live the rest of their lives and the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and they play a critical role yeah. in that. So all of it, you know, when I read the book and I, I say this to every, every presentation, when you sit down with the book, you have to have a marker. Because uh, <laughs> you uh, have to underline uh, it speaks to so many people in so many ways. What the purpose of bringing them all together is a team, listening to each other, not dismissing or being intimidated. It, it's it's wonderful. I, I thought you were going to say instead of a marker, you need to sit down with a margarita. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that too, I guess. I guess it, it's it's up to what whatever your yeah. marker and your margarita. I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Roz, I mean, you talked about um, these various uh, programs, and now you know Bunny and Peter have talked about these seven keys. Do you have a sense of you know why or how these keys are so relevant to? the people that you're meeting in these community events? Well, it's, as Bunny said, everybody knows somebody or themselves personally who've been through something in the healthcare system and you want to tear your hair out because uh, the doctor doesn't listen or you have to tell your story 95 times to everybody you talk to. And um, people are, you know, I... People are, are nervous about uh, maybe contradicting the doctor or asking for a second opinion. They really do not know what their rights are. And so just like with MAID, when we say, yes, MAID is legal, you can do this. When you say to them, yes, you can talk to your doctor, you can ask for a second opinion, you know, like they go, oh, I never knew that. Or when you, when you make some suggestions about, you know, the walk two paths and seven keys, for me, that really resonates because um, people are always told when they have a diagnosis, I had a sister with cancer and everybody said to her, you know, just, you need to be positive because, you know, it's gonna, if you're not positive, you're, you're not gonna get better. And, and you feel like a failure if you're, if you're thinking bad thoughts. So mm -hmm. what seven keys does is it gives people a perspective it helps people understand their rights. And every single one of us, whether we've been through it or we know somebody who's been through it, it just resonates with how, how you as a patient or you as a caregiver can make the system work for you. And that it, it you know, it's a scary thing for a lot of people to contradict a doctor or to ask a question or, or you know, to just be more engaged um, as a patient. Mm -hmm. So I think I think this is a whole set of lessons for people that 
uh, once they understand what that it's it's not going to jeopardize their care because I mm-hmm. think a lot of people are afraid of that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that you as a patient and you as a family member are a partner in the medical system. Mm-hmm. Again, people don't think of themselves that mm-hmm. way. So mm-hmm. I think that this really gives people permission to do the kinds of things that they really need to do to mm-hmm. make their care work for them. And uh, yeah. so I think it fits in with with all the kinds of things we uh, in dying with dignity, talk to people about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Uh, I also yeah. think that it really fits with the demographics for a couple of reasons. Oh, yeah. I mm-hmm. think the baby boomers are aging, the the silver tsunami, and mm-hmm. so there are a lot of people that are either you know approaching end of life or dealing with aging parents, and so it's becoming top of mind. And baby boomers are are used to exploring their options, and and they want to be informed mm-hmm. and they want to make decisions. Mm-hmm. And and that I think is a little different than the generation that preceded them. So I, yeah. I think all of this is very timely. Yeah. What's the generation before them is called like the yes generation or something like that. It's like the, the, post, the, the, the post-war on, generation, you know, like my parents. Yeah. They, they were the post-war generation and, and they doctors were gods. Doctors. Yeah. yeah. The good old days. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, yeah, they just they whatever the doctor said, they just did. Right. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of baby boomers, you know, still have that sense. Yes. Um, so, you know, for me, as a, a baby boomer and a child of the 60s, 70s, I mm-hmm. was involved in the women's movement. I was involved mm-hmm. in the abortion movement. I mm-hmm. want to control my destiny. And so mm-hmm. this this really resonates, uh, as mm-hmm. Peter said, with a lot, a lot of baby boomers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I, oh, go ahead, Benny. Well, and I've been involved in my family uh, with many um, unfortunate health situations uh, where we felt powerless mm-hmm. and it was heart wrenching. And uh, the few times more relatively recently that I said I was going to speak up, I was told by other family members, don't, don't alienate the doctor, Mm -hmm. don't walk the boat. And sometimes what was being told was so um, disrespectful to us. And that needed to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. Like called out. And, And I promised myself after some awful things that happened that I would never let, for example, someone in my family die alone. Mm-hmm. Or I would um, never just passively let uh, someone be sent home or mm-hmm. um, have to come on a regular basis for appointments when it really wasn't necessary or it was, it didn't make sense in light mm-hmm. of how the person was. You know, it it took a lot of guts and the, the system and the societal expectations were saying, do not do that. Mm-hmm. And what the two of you mm-hmm. are saying is do it. Don't mm-hmm. do it aggressively. Don't do it with vengeance. Be assertive. Mm-hmm. What's the term? Be Re- respectfully, respectfully, respectfully assertive. assertive. Yeah. 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 Or someone and, else said, gently fierce. <laughs> that's right. And I use that yeah. term all the time. I couldn't read mm-hmm. it. Right yeah. Um, and that's what we have to um, uh, give permission is it's almost like we have to give permission. We have to yeah. encourage people mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. speak up. It's their bodies. It's mm-hmm. their, life. It's their mm-hmm. loved one's life. How can we make sure that the next decisions are made um, in the best way possible, not just according to what always has been done because mm-hmm. what always has been done is not necessarily yeah that's right for you yeah do you know what i'm i've never thought of this but i don't know why but as i'm listening i'm wondering if just like there's a difference between the way patients and their designated families um their expectations of the healthcare system or their relationship with the healthcare system depends on the generation i do wonder also if the B side is true that depending on the generation of the doctor oh, yeah. that you're dealing with, it probably makes a big difference too. And I hope that 
the younger generation is not the same as the, well, the doctor knows best generation, you know, it'd be interesting to, to dive it's so, in deeper. It's so different. I, I had yeah. history with orthopedic surgery um, yeah. in the nineties and I could not ask the doctor anything and everything was in his purview I had no yeah. you know there was no email there was no way to correspond and mm -hmm. there were gatekeepers so his secretary was the gatekeeper you know mm -hmm. it, was, mm -hmm. it was awful and then I had orthopedic surgery not very long ago and I called the doctor by his first name we email each other he yeah. phoned me I was mean, he younger yeah, oh, yeah he was Russ? younger the other yeah, he was younger. Yes. yeah. and the other he was one was 12. Yeah, well, like, he the other one like was that. old when I saw him and you know he just got older and more cantankerous and yeah. this new young whippersnapper yeah I, and <laughs> and they're all like that all the younger doctors that I've dealt with are you know they they introduce themselves by their first name they're mm -hmm. quite casual they're so smart mm -hmm. and they really you know spend time quality time and are so easy to access and uh it's it's so different yeah i think there are changes i mean it's That's not just hopeful. yeah the the um the generation but also culture change in medicine too but i just wanted to i know we're sort of uh nearing the end but, but i did want to just already I, yeah the uh, mm -hmm. bunny and peter have been teaching a few of these workshops so how has that been going maybe i'll ask bunny first and peter can build on it but uh, you've been teaching these uh workshops on the seven keys like what has that been like has it been good response uh, what things have you sensed that people are taking away oh I, i'd like peter to, to start because he's the one who delivers the gist of the information and then i kind of do the tweaking and massaging of it so peter mm -hmm. you want to do that sure um I think broadly people that attend are really interested in the content and I, I think they're really appreciative of having fairly plain language deal mm -hmm. with topics that people either, you know, kind of obfuscate on or just really don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been interesting because the presentations are equally valuable to seniors and people with aging parents. So mm -hmm. there's kind of a double audience. Um, and we've had success in, um, presenting in what are called naturally occurring retirement communities. So the mm. city of Toronto and the University Health Network have identified buildings, condos and apartment buildings and co-ops where there's oh. um, a significant concentration of seniors. Mm -hmm. And and those are great buildings to talk to because they often have um, kind of social networks and, mm -hmm. and they, we can go and present at one of their, you know, regular monthly events or one mm -hmm. of their regular weekly events kind of thing. So Th those are a few of the learnings I think that um, I've experienced from from our presentations. Mm. They're called NORCs, <laughs> naturally occurring retirement. Wow, that's community. new. <laughs> so someone asked me where you're going. I said I'm meeting with some NORCs. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> Not NARCs. Yeah. No, NARCs. 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 Wonderful audiences so far. We've only done a, a couple. Um, I, uh, P Peter, as I said, does the uh, bulk of the presentation walking us through. And what we're doing now, we're just kind of, as I said, massaging it, is as he talks about it, I try and give an example. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Peter has done that has been excellent is he starts off the session, and I think Jeff did that in, uh, in April, who here has dealt with a person who has uh, has had a, a major diagnosis yeah. and, and whatever. And those are the questions. And then I pick it up with saying, um, as we go through these seven keys, I'm sure you are, they're triggering um, memories, visions mm -hmm. of things that you've gone through. And what I, we're hoping to do, because it's just uh, an, hour and a, an hour and 15 minute presentation at this point, is we want our my goal is for them to walk out not with those visions that you know bring back mm -hmm. attention mm -hmm. to have a plan mm -hmm. which of these keys will be the most helpful to you which mm -hmm. do you feel um is most overwhelming and what can you do about it mm -hmm. so it's it's that kind of thing helping them step forward and then ultimately 
you know, with, with your support, do mm -hmm. some workshops on that. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that had that happened last, was it last week we did the, the session? I've lost track of time. Mm -hmm. um, that people start thinking about many other related questions. So we had a lot of questions that were really related to advanced care plan. Mm -hmm. plan. And a lot of questions and misinformation mm -hmm. uh, about palliative. Mm -hmm. you know, it's still the issue about you only go into palliative for the last few hours or days of your life, which mm -hmm. is the case. how do you access palliative and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you asked before, Tien, how this fits with whatever else we offer, it's, mm -hmm. it's all there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this deserves its own time and own session, but mm -hmm. how to, it all comes together, but yet we have to guide people and mm -hmm. two roads mm -hmm. or three roads or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, it, it, it's very valuable and it will be evolving, Peter, don't you think? Absolutely. We'll yeah. learn and we'll improve. Yes. You know what what we did, which was really informative for our workbook, was uh, every time we presented, we would write down the questions, you know, that, and then we actually compile, like, there's only so many questions that people ask, right? And after doing many presentations, we had a handful of most frequently asked questions, and that helped us to um, revamp and, you know, um, develop the workbook that clearly the book didn't answer this. And now we have like these pressing 12 questions or more. And so I would, I would suggest you guys keep track of the questions because it might be, um, something for, for later content. Yeah. Yeah. We're not getting the kinds of questions we're getting with ACP or MAID or EOL. They're, mm -hmm. Those are very factual. This, these seem to have a much more emotional component. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we've just done a couple of them. So, uh, you mm -hmm. know, stay tuned. Love, yeah. Yeah. Listen for themes. Some of them. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll follow or, up. Yeah, but, but we're almost at the end of our time. I would love to hear maybe briefly from each of you. What are you guys excited about moving forward? Maybe I'll start with Roz. Looking forward, is there something that is exciting you? Yeah, well, you know, the NORCs. <laughs> <laughs> we we do mainly in-person workshops with NORCs. So um, <laughs> NORCs. one of them, we've done um, the, the first three. And... Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to see a session tomorrow and um, with Dr. Jean Marmorial, who lives mm -hmm. in one of the Norks. So mm -hmm. we're, we're going to um, remind them that we have a new, a new session now, and I'm sure they'll sign up for it. So for me, mm -hmm. it's being able to go back and visit with some of the people that we met doing earlier workshops mm -hmm. and reaching out to those other Norks and letting them know we've got another another session because it's it's like it's an educational package now that we're delivering mm -hmm. and uh, we're Amazing. we're becoming really familiar with people and uh and getting connected to them and that's very exciting mm -hmm. thanks Roz. and peter how about you yeah I, i'm excited i think it's a great offering we have and i think it's getting some momentum because you talk to people in one building and then somebody in the next building goes oh i heard about this and, mm -hmm. and it allows us to to get and speak to to more people, and and mm -hmm. I also think um, you know it, it's not really dying with dignity's mandate, but I I do find it exciting that I think as patients and their families start to learn what's in the, in the seven keys, it's actually going to reshape the medical system a little bit as well because if if the physicians keep getting <laughs> you know saying saying okay doctor you know, help, help me walk two paths on this. Well, <laughs> help me zoom experience. out. Yeah. You had that experience, Roz. I forget was you, you used the word trajectory with one of your specialists and they kind of went. <laughs> <and> <laughs> Good so, for you. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's exciting as well. Mm -hmm. And Benny. Well, what's exciting to me is, is how this is is spreading. I, I too, I did just finished a group with a uh, Unitarian church. I did it. I did three workshops with three groups of people and now they're 
they heard about the uh, seven keys and they want that too. Mm. And so people are talking. The thing that excites me, and it's very different than what everybody else said, is when people thank me, it's not the thanking me. It's the relief they feel. They feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They communicate a lightness. Um, mm-hmm. They have a path. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have mm-hmm. gumption. Mm-hmm. You know, someone said, I could never talk to my kids about this. Oh, they mm-hmm. talked about their kids. Mm-hmm. I, I can't name just one substitute decision maker. I have to name them all because they'll be mad at me if I don't. Mm-hmm. We talk about it and it works it out. Mm-hmm. So that's exciting to me to see how individual people are taking the information, making it their own, mm-hmm. and and feeling the as Ross kept saying the right the mm-hmm. uh, to be able to do that. So that's it, very exciting to me. You know what? In, in listening to you describe that, it's I never thought of this, but it's almost like in sharing it, it's an intervention in itself. It makes Absolutely. people feel better. And then they can move forward and become unfrozen and take the next steps. But if someone leaves um, an interaction or a a talk or an educational session actually feeling better, it's not just information sharing, it's an intervention. And I think that 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 excites me, actually. It also, not that you're asking me, Sam, what excites me, but it also excites me that we are partnering with what I thought was just a very unlikely, um, I hate to say that again, but partnership. I am tickled pink about this. I mean, <laughs> it was so great to talk to the three of you, Roz, yeah. Peter, Bunny. Thank you so much for reaching out, finding our work, um, inviting us and and continuing the conversation on today's podcast. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. Visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, for more information, to join our newsletter, and to check out our book, Hope for the Best, Plan for the Rest. This podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Shopa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sipek. And our theme music is Maypole by Ketsa.